Another type of logical instruction which you will find in a typical computer program is what I like to call control logic. Control logic is directly concerned with the flow and management of a specific program. Now there is a subset of control logic which I like to call build logic and this kind of code concerns itself with creating and wiring together different objects in the system. In this case, I am not talking so much about data models, but when we get to part 5 of this course, the objects I am speaking of will become clear. Control statements are used to direct the flow of an application in a logical way. They represent a form of decision-making capacity which allows programs to react appropriately to different states, or data, and potential problems which we call exceptions. In this video, we will write out a few examples to learn and practice the basics. Most control statements make use of what are called Boolean expressions. I will not go into great detail here, but it is worth mentioning that Boolean algebra is one of the most fundamental and important concepts to study in the creation of digital computing systems. In any case, we will stick to Java-specific discussions. As discussed in the lesson on primitives, Java has a primitive type called Boolean or Boolean, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it. A Boolean may either represent true or false. You can assign a boolean directly to true or false, but most of the time we assign the value based on some kind of boolean expression. For our first boolean expression, we will use the equality operator. Although most IDEs are good at catching this mistake, always be careful when working with the equality operator that you are not using a single equal sign. A single equal sign is interpreted as an assignment statement, and it can create some very unfortunate and unexpected behavior. We are now going to learn about the syntax for these keywords in Java. To keep our examples a bit more organized, we will create a new method. I am going to use some help from my IDE to speed this process up. Alright, so please keep in mind that some of these examples here are not designed to be optimal. This is mostly about new concept and syntax practice, but if you think you can fix things up and solve these problems in fewer lines, I think that would be good practice for you. So, for those who are not aware, the absolute value of an integer is represented by its distance from zero on a number line. Therefore, the absolute value of positive 5 is 5, and the absolute value of negative 5 is also 5. The first thing we will do is convert any negative values to positive values if necessary. To do that, we will check if the values are negative, and if they are, extract their absolute value using a standard library function. If the boolean expression evaluates to true, we execute whatever is in the body of the if statement and we skip the else statement, and vice versa. Now, since the body of our statements are on a single line, we do not actually need to use curly brackets here. If you need several lines of code, you must use curly brackets. Sometimes you need to perform more than two comparisons in order to find the appropriate execution path. For this, we can use an if else statement following an if statement. Let us finish off this method. Sometimes we want to be able to evaluate several Boolean expressions in a single if statement, or wherever else we can use a Boolean expression. Let us write out another method which will be capable of checking the number of occurrences of a given character in a given string. We also want this method to be capable of handling null values for the string, and you will find that I love explicit method names. Okay, now we will implement that method. Now, if the string is null, or it happens to be empty, then we know that occurrences will be equal to zero. Since both of these cases end up with the same result, we can combine them using an AND operator. We will also use the NOT equals operator, which does exactly what it reads like. The AND operator states that both expressions on either side of it must evaluate to true, otherwise it will default to false. There is another operator called the OR operator, which evaluates to true if at least one statement on either side of it is true. On my keyboard, I can write this operator by holding SHIFT plus backslash, which sits below my backspace key. Alright, to finish off this method, I am going to use what is called an enhanced for loop, or in other languages, a for each loop. It iterates through every element in an array or collection without having to mess around with creating and incrementing indexes. Let us code out the else statement since it is easy. 
I forgot to mention it earlier, but you can chain together as many else if statements as you like. However, if you find that all of those if else statements are performing some comparison on the same value, it is almost always better to use a switch statement. We are going to write another method which checks to see if any inputted integer is a power of 2. The switch statement starts by supplying some kind of variable as a predicate. Next, we supply a number of different cases, which the switch statement will use as comparisons to evaluate our expression. We can include as many lines as we want after the colon and before either the next break keyword or the next case. The break keyword is actually optional here, we use it if we want to break out of executing the switch statement. Otherwise, it will keep evaluating until it reaches the end of the block, executing any case that evaluates to true. This example is pretty stupid, but I will add just a few more statements to make it slightly more useful. There is one more feature of the switch statement which works kind of like else. As the name implies, if none of our cases match the predicate, then the code in the default block will be executed automatically. One thing universal about computing systems is that they do not like surprises at all. By surprises, I mean situations which interrupt the normal flow of an application, and the appropriate name to call such a situation is an exception. Unfortunately, if our code does not appropriately handle these exceptions, then the typical result is that the application crashes. The good news is that with a bit of knowledge of situations when a crash is likely to occur, combined with a construct like the try-catch statement, we can often recover the situation appropriately. One thing before I proceed though, sometimes even if we do a really great job handling exceptions, the program will still crash. These unrecoverable exceptions can be caused by hardware or operating system errors or other similar issues. While they are very infrequent, you will find that even the best and most successful applications out there crash from time to time. We are going to create a new method, but this time we will reuse some code from the null safe count occurrences method to save time. I am going to copy and paste the implementation from the other method, then make some changes. So what we have left is our algorithm for counting occurrences. Since we are no longer explicitly checking for a null string, this code would crash the application as soon as it is given a null string. To be specific, when the computer reached the text.toCarArray statement, it would throw a null pointer exception and the whole program would crash. Since we are aware of that, we can anticipate this null pointer exception and handle it without having this crash occur. As you can see, the try-catch kind of looks like an if-else statement, and it is fairly easy to understand. The computer will attempt to execute whatever code is in the body of the try statement. If an exception is thrown, which would automatically happen if the string is null, then the program will stop what it is doing and resume execution within the catch block. The catch block will quite literally catch that exception, and then it will assign the exception to the variable, in this case variable e. If you are not sure what exception will be thrown, you can make it more generic by using the exception class. I have not explained inheritance yet, but we will look at that in the next part of this course. Sometimes we expect an exception may possibly be thrown, but we do not want to handle that exception locally. Let us copy the try-catch demo method entirely, paste it below, rename it, and remove the try-catch block. Again, we know an exception might occur, but we want the exception to be handled wherever this method was initially called. To achieve this, we add the throws keyword to the end of the method signature, before the method body, and specify what kind of exception we expect. To test this out, I will add a call to this main method and execute it. As you can see, our exception did actually cause the program to crash. As a quick coding exercise to finish this lesson off, I want you to find out how to stop this program from crashing without removing or changing this call to try catch demo throw, or modifying the method itself. Now you do not need to do anything specific other than simply preventing the program from crashing out. Good luck.